We're going to talk about Stein's tender buttons, but I imagine there might be some general Stein questions. So let's get started. Lily, who do we have on the phone? Uh, we have Sophia calling from the Bay Area with a question about Stein, and it's also her birthday. Okay, so <laughs> oh, let's birthday. bring her up. S Sophia? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. This is Al. So what is your question about Stein? Tell well, us. Well, it's actually more of an epiphany. I had this epiphany. You know, like many other people, I have been reading Stein, and even though I've had some exposure to modern poetry and I write, but, you know, it was, uh, you know, I joked to my friend that I need to do Stein in homeopathic doses because it's, <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> it's um, so... I suddenly, you know, you sent me, sent all the students the note saying about the live webcast and um, the, the end of the note you signed off with something, a quote from Stein, which was loving repeating. Loving repeating, yes. And it suddenly clicked. I had an epiphany. I, I realized that I was thinking about Stein in the wrong way, in a linear way, going from point A to point B. That's not how her writing works. Um, I I had this vision of Pina Bausch, you know, the experimental yes. dancer, and I realized the repetition in Pina Bausch, the way that moves through space, I needed to think of Stein in terms of spatial relationships, not linear nice. relationships. Okay, good. And as soon as I thought of that, everything clicked into place. Um, I understand how her writing is nonlinear, how it's... I understood everything all of a sudden. That's great. So that's, so that's my epiphany. That's great. Sophia, how about if we do this? Why don't you go off the phone and turn your computer back on and listen to our responses? And I'm going to invite yes, um, I will. Uh, Ron, Bob, and Rachel briefly in that order just to comment on anything Sophia said, uh, either to talk about loving repeating or this idea of uh, spatial writing. Um, Ron, would you start on that? Sure. I actually uh, tend to agree with uh, Sophia. Happy birthday, Sophia. Um, Stein's work often proceeds in my head um, rhythmically, and that seems to be very close to, I think, what Sophia is saying. I often, after reading a little bit, particularly of Tender Buttons, find myself uh, sort of habitually putting all of my observations into various Steinian rhythms that one could easily see as leading into dance lines, much the way that the poem before us, A, a Long Dress, could easily have been a challenge for an episode of Project Runway, um, and which, in fact, actually at some point I'm going to suggest to the people of Project Runway, uh, because it would make a great episode. Uh, in those terms, you can take her work and move it in plastically in many di different directions. Every once in a while, I hear uh, the notebooks of William James in her work. That's, I think, the closest she gets to a, a logical process as such. But uh, there is a um, subterranean um, motive always at work. Uh, and her, her writing is actually quite remarkably clear, given the fact that it seems very abstract. Thank you, Ron. That's terrific. Bob, do you want to take a shot at any of those topics? Well, I'm just uh, wondering about the notion of space. And there can be um, a sense of space that is uh, contained and knowable at once, like a map, uh, you know, in the national parks. You are here. Yeah. Uh, where you see the whole thing and you know where you are. And I think with Stein, that's that's not a helpful idea. I'm not saying that Sophia is thinking that way, but it's easy to sort of you to take the word space and to take it over that way. I think with Stein, the the, the sense of um, you are here is central. That the the continuing uh, continual present is what's really important, and it doesn't. Things don't add up narratively, and so you, you, your focus stays on the present of a sentence, um, and a sentence can change syntax mid-sentence, or one sentence can say something quite different than the prior sentence, etc. So it's really, um, in a funny way, presentist, mm -hmm. which is kind of anti-space in, in right. that other map Interesting. sense. Interesting. Um, 
So I'm going to turn to Rachel, but first I'm just going to remind you that the phone number is 215-573-9752. And of course, everybody wants to be the third caller so they get <laughs> a copy of uh, Julia's uh, book. And after, after Rachel's comment, um, Julia, we'll turn to you to see if there's some questions in the forum. Rachel, please. Yeah, let's see. It was about um, repetition. Yes. The, the issue for me is that Stein resists many, many of the ways that we consume writing uh, normally. And it is so, it is so anti-normative that one almost thinks that it's anti-everything. But it's partially the things that you want, and it's partially not the things you want. By which I mean, it seems to be not non-mimetic, but not mimetic either. So it's sort of semi-mimetic. You get words that you recognize, like malachite or milk or something, but you I get didn't recognize malachite. I had to look you, it up. Uh, words you can Oh, recognize. well, you know, <laughs> what can I say? Some of us. Some of us had to, you know, some of us who took geography and were deeply, deeply affected by it. Uh, so it's, it is not entirely narrative, but it, and it seems, it's sort of semi-narrative because there are narrative bits that go along, but it's also not narrative. And the, the thing that is quite amazing in terms of repetition or repeating, it doesn't repeat. There's no memory. And w one of the things that's the strangest about Stein is that you can read it and then you can reread it, and it's as if you never did read it. You can memorize it eventually. Wow. That is. The short that, ones, the short that, ones. That is, you can, you know, some of us know it well and um, well enough to re retain certain moments of Stein. But the the erasure of memory and the erasure mm. of history in one's reading process is extremely radical. So um, it really pushes against many of the laws or the internalized mechanisms that one has for consuming writing. Wow, you know, just that's... That's a great, thank you. Thank You're you all. Um, Julia, a comment from the forums? I have a question that I think relates to what Rachel was just saying. This mm -hmm. is from, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm going to say Chia. Um, so this is a question about reading Stein. Um, and this Modpo student writes, to a student of poetry, the poetry seems to defy close reading. It's very, very difficult to read the poems normatively in the way that you just described and the student suggesting it. It also defies maybe some of the other even kinds of close reading that we learn in the classroom. So the question here is, is that complexity purposely set up as a reaction to Victorian era poetry? Is it what, is it what we know as the thing that makes the poems modernist or the pieces modernist? Sort of what is that complexity about? So Chia, I think you've, you've asked two questions and I think I'm going to exercise my control as moderator to ask us to look at the first part of that, which is, um, is an applied question, is, is the tactics, the strategies of close reading that we've been doing in this course and we'll do a lot in this course, do they work well for Stein? Is that the appropriate method? And I think I'm going to ask again all three of you, but promise to be brief, I'd love to hear your views on this, starting with Ron again. Close reading work for uh, tender buttons? Well, I think it works in the sense that it will provide you with a lot of word-by-word, phrase-by-phrase information. If, in, if you're looking for a specific kind of uh, narrative or figurative um, setting to then come out of that, however, I think you're going to be quite frustrated. Okay. Uh, I, I think you sort of get going and you keep moving, but it doesn't ever particularly lead to a tableau. Good, thank you. Bob, what do you think about this? I, I think that um, you have to read Stein in a way more closely mm -hmm. than close reading. Um, <clears throat> the, each word is quite an event, each word is an event in Stein. Um, <clears throat> the, the twist is that for close reading, there is the sense of uh, looking at something, putting it in perfect focus, and you come out with a very clear photograph of one thing. In Stein's case, um, the close reading gives you uh, multiple uh, semantics, multiple scenarios. Great. Thank you, Bob. Rachel? The thing about close reading that we're a little bit forgetting when, when we talk about it now is that 
close reading is also associated with new criticism, which is an extractive reading strategy that goes to themes and to folding things in to a kind of poise that is often paradoxical. Um, Stein is very difficult to do this with. Mm -hmm. So you can exercise the tactic of close reading, meaning you can do the wonderful job that some of the Penn students did on the tapes that you might have, might have seen, of doing the dictionary thing um, very, very well and, and finding this kind of splay of words, but you can't resolve the narrative or the, or the thematics or so on. In many ways, Stein has subtexts but she has no texts. <laughs> and that becomes a very strange um, reading effect. So what you, you can um, say that something hits the surfaces of the words and then generates a material out of those dictionary definitions of the surface, but that the cubist strategy, which some people have talked about, notably Marjorie Perloff and others, were you see different sides of an object is not really actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that because what's happening to me is that when you get a word or a phrase, because Stein often works by small phrases, a spoon is, or a sudden right. spoon something, and you know you, you segment the phrases, yeah. but what happens is instead of going in, like here's a, here's a surface of the object and here's the bottom of the object and here's the side and so on, right. the cubist thing, right. um, you, you go out. And some of the going out from these words is are actually cul-de-sac. That is, you can't go any further. You just get out to this, and then nothing happens. Right. And some of them go very, very far. So they're irregular in their shape, whereas a cubist thing is not irregular in its shape. It's, you know, you get the carafe or whatever, the blind glass, whatever, yeah. um, that you're looking at. Al, yeah. let, me, let me... Yeah, brief, though. Brief. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a really a key moment with Stein is, is, say, in composition as explanation, the opening right. sentence. The only thing that makes a difference a difference, and then she goes on to say, but the way she uses a difference differently, <laughs> that, um, right. that any word in Stein is, it's really a frame, and it's a frame that can be accessed multiply. So... Yeah. You know, one of your students was worrying that st words don't have meaning in, St in Stein. I think that's not true. I think they they're ex extremely meaningful each one, but they mean lots of different things, and they can mean their opposite. And yeah. there can be a difference that doesn't make any difference. Yeah, yeah. And there can be a difference that ah, makes a difference. So well put. I'm already feeling like this was such a great idea to invite you to comment on this because this, you know, we have thousands of people in in Modpo who are grappling with Gertrude Stein, some of them for the first time, and, and they ask the kinds of questions uh, to which your comments have been answered, so this is great. Um, I want to go to a call uh, with Lily, and then what I want to do, Katie, is sort of ask a bunch of people to say ver something very briefly to which our poets will respond, people in the room, so get ready, uh, Jeremy Dixon and others. Lily, who do we have on the phone? Zach, can you... Um, this is Maria calling from Greece with a question about Stein. Okay, let's bring Maria up. Hello, Maria. This is Al. Hey. So do you have a question or a comment about Gertrude Stein? Yes. After I, I just I just like to ask something. After reading Williams and then reading uh, Gertrude Stein, I would like to ask something about these poets that do something that's avant-garde. I mean. She wrote a poem in 1914, The Tender Buttons. I mean, it's great. Uh, they try to reintroduce the world to us in a, in a new form, in a new poetic line. So are they actually, by reintroducing the world, are they reinventing the world? Are they regaining the world? Okay. I mean, that's a general question. That's a good question. Are you Anne-Marie or Maria? Maria. Maria. Okay. Yes. Uh, Maria, what I, I'm going to sort of restate what I think your question was, or at least say the topic, and then invite Ron, Bob, and Rachel each briefly to comment in any way they like about that. Okay, um, great. What was what what was Stein's purpose in those early years? She was doing something so different. Um, was she remaking the word? Was she reconceiving how words get used? Or was it she, world that she was remaking? I thought she said I'll, world. I'll throw world in there too. That's what I heard. Maria, would you... Uh, yeah, it's, would, a, it's like the Wittgenstein thing, my words, my world. 
You know, oh, world. Okay, got like it. That, okay? Got it. So, was this revolutionary, not just uh, linguistically, but uh, socially, politically, geographically, yes. etc.? Very good. Yes. Maria, thank you for the call. Thank you. And I love you all. Love I you wish too. You this all is in great. City. All right. Thank take you very care. Much. All right. Bye, so, we're going to take uh, Maria's, we're going to answer a question off the air. I'm going to turn to Ron. You want to address this briefly in any way you like? Uh, sure. I well, I you know, thinking that this book is coming up on its uh, centennial, one of the things that occurs to me is that the concept even of what a word was linguistically was very, very different at the time that Stein was writing this. She's really coming out of 19th century philosophy and philology, and she is extending some ideas from that world, particularly from William James and uh, also doing some very new and different things that had not been done before except possibly in painting um, in which objects had been used in different ways. Thank you Ron. Bob, your thoughts on this? I have the same thoughts as Ron. Um, no, I, I think the, 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 the uh, analogy with painting was crucial and uh, she talks about Cezanne and the way he put um, uh, small patches of color, each one, uh, each patch being of equal importance, no foreground, no background. I think that was a great instigation for new ways of using words mm -hmm. for her. That's so. great. Thanks, I'm going to invite a bunch of you to say in a sentence or two, what you are encountering this week as you're reading Gertrude Stein and Mod Poe, just throw it out there. A topic, an issue, a problem. Very briefly, I want to collect these and have our guests respond. So, Ken, do you want to say, go first? Well, I come to this new life in writing from a life in architecture. And um, I struggle a little bit with Stein, but the comment made earlier by a caller about reading Stein spatially really knocked me out. Um, I, the, the ways that space was mentioned, the dancing uh, analogy and the, the map and all of that, I see it differently because I, when I think architecture, I see space and objects in space. And thinking now in a new way about yes. Stein yeah. from that perspective. That's nice. Fabulous. Thank you. That's great, Ken. Bring it all the way over to Jeremy at the end of that row. Jeremy, briefly. Hello, Jeremy. Hello. So glad that you joined us. Thank you. I hope you have a lot to do in the United States other than come to a ModPo live webcast, which you could get at home in Cardiff. <coughs> no, I've got a packed itinerary. Okay, great. <laughs> great. Uh, um, I was just going to say, um, do you think for all the people studying ModPo <coughs> as where English isn't their first language? Yeah. They're actually at an advantage with Stein. <laughs> okay, because great. Because some of the, you know, the structures that we have, got it. They might not be there, and and I, and I, I just wonder if they should take that as a positive away. That's great. Us. We are going to definitely address that one. Do you want to bring the mic forward? Uh, this is Richard, I believe. Hello, Richard. This is your first time to the Writer's House. I think. It is. Thank you, Al. And you've been involved with Modpo. Yes. And how's it going so far? Beautiful. Great. Do you want to say something, throw an issue out that the group will respond to? For me, the difficult and amazing thing about Stein's work comes from listening to it online, listening to her read it. And there is the largest difference between the, the enjoyment that I get from her reading it compared to, the read, okay. to my own reading of it. And I can't understand why it's so understandable when I hear her, nice. and so much less understandable when I try to do it myself. These are such great issues. How are we going to handle them all? Uh, let's do two more. So we'll go to Ray and then Karen. Ray, hi. Hi. Hi, hi Modpo World. <laughs> um, I, I had a question. There's actually. a lot of Ray Maxwell fans out there. <laughs> oh, boy. Ray, seriously, you're a star. Uh, I, just a question for the members of the panel, and maybe we can, we can discuss it uh, later. Um, these um, leaders of poetic movements have had uh, sort of descendants and have found um, themselves manifested in, in popular culture, I think, in, in, in various ways. And I'm wondering, um, how, has that, how has Gertrude Stein's work worked its way through Such a highbrow question. culture to, to everyday culture? Love it. All right. That's another one. I love that question. And we'll go to Karen for the last of these. 
Um, just want to say that Gertrude Stein was the people's modernist. So the um, people's modernist. The people's modernist. Um, so uh, we need to keep that in mind because she spoke with very simple words, and she meant for the man on the street, the woman on the street, to hear her. Um, what I'm struggling with is kind of strange because I'm thinking, what would Stein's world have been like, her artistic world, had there been no Picasso, had there been no Brock? Okay, great. All right, I'm going to summarize these and invite uh, Ron and Bob and Rachel to say anything they like about any of these issues. So Ken talked about reading spatially, uh, to, to put it briefly from the and 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 felt it was a revelation for him Jeremy talked about how it might be an advantage to be a second language reader speaker in Modpo to be encountering Stein uh, Richard talked about the difference in listening to Stein Ray taught, asked about pop culture influences to this day and Karen after asserting that Stein is the people's modernist wondered what her world would be like without Picasso would have been like without Picasso or Brock Ron, do you want to take one or two of those and, and be yeah, as brief as you can? Yeah, the, the one that really hit home for me was Ray's, um, because I think it's a, a fabulous question. Stein was the people's modernist in that she was popular and relatively accessible, partly because of the size of many of her better-known works. I mean, we're not talking making of Americans today. We're talking... Uh, sort of the other end of her work. But when she died, I mean, her, you know, after World War II, when she did uh, Willie and Brewster, or Brewster and Willie, I guess it is, uh, she was very much like the kind of modernist avant-garde poet you could see in Life magazine or in Time. And she was treated quite sort of um, comically, uh, as a bit of a joke, and since that helped sell copies of uh, some of her books, I think she was more than a little willing to let that go forward. But it meant that in the 1950s, after she died, she died in, I believe, uh, June or July of uh, 1946. And uh, in the 1950s, you could not find a serious reader of Gertrude Stein outside of Robert Duncan anywhere in the English-speaking world. <laughs> and it was only in the later 60s and 70s that her work began to come back uh, into reading and into prominence, and it feels very good at this moment in the 21st century to realize that you can't read the 20th century without including Stein. Uh, it's a complete transformation. When you think of the elitism that surrounded the, the modernism, say, of Ezra Pound, who was the other big modernist who was in the news a lot at the end of World War II because of his treason trial, and the kind of cloistered elitism that surrounded T.S. Eliot up until his death, um, you know, we have seen great transformations in the reputations of all of these people. Uh, not one of them is the writer they were the day they died. Great. Thank you, Ron. Bob, your thoughts on any of those questions? <clears throat> well, there are too many to be brief about, so I'll just pick a couple. The language question, I don't know. I mean, I'm... I'm mostly monolingual to my shame, I would think that not knowing English well would be would make reading Stein quite hard. Um, it's hard enough when you know English to, to read to, to the energy athleticism that's required. Um, it, it really taxes one's in a nice way taxes one's reading mind. Um, no Picasso, no Brock, no Stein. Uh, she would have she would have continued on the track of uh, uh, kind of a uh, slightly turgid um, uh, William James scientist, mm -hmm. a novelist like Making of Americans. I hope I'm not treading on toes when I say that. Um, the 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 burst of freedom, syntactic semantic freedom she got from uh, painting. Um, it was transformative. I mean, she she wrote nothing like Tender Buttons before, um, and in fact, she didn't write too much like Tender Buttons afterwards either. But that's a whole other set of questions. 
Thank you, Bob. That was great. Rachel? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things, as Gertrude Stein might have said. I think I could answer that other question now um, that I said I wasn't going to answer, which is to say something about the experimental processes of Zola and 19th century novel, because the, the questions that we're avoiding here are historical questions, which is kind of comic. And it is hard to be historical about Stein to in place an hour. her in an hour, right? right. Um, Zola in the experimental novel said something like, you have to keep things like a, like a scientific experiment, which you have to keep much steady state, neutral, and then do one thing. Right. And uh, Stein experiment. did that. In other words, that's what that's one of her processes. That's what she she tended to do. Okay. The language question is interesting. Stein's syntax in Tender Buttons is is generally fairly um, straightforward. This is a strange thing to say. If you look at her verbs, there are not that many of them. They're mostly is or makes. The sentence structure is generally not hypotactic. That is not subordinated. I, I'm not trying to overgeneralize too much here. So it looks as if you're reading definitions of things. This is this. That is that. And for a non-English speaking person, the syntax might be sort of held steady state, whereas the word, and the words are fairly simple. There are very few um, co very complex words. So it might feel as if you're getting it, but I would say that nobody's really getting it, not even right now, not even here and now. And, it, <laughs> and, and one of the, in response to the question about being read to, rather than, um, I guess it's Richard, listening, um, yeah. li sort of listening to something rather than reading it yourself, it's a fantastic question in a way for me because it does again point to one's conventions of reading. You put your eye on the page, you expect certain things. For example, you expect literariness from a literary page. And what you're getting is linguisticness. So that's the other thing you're getting when somebody's reading to you. And do we have that many recordings of Stein where you... We don't have that many. That, so you may be hearing other people reading Stein in a very Steinian way. Well, I think Richard way. probably was thinking of, if I told him, would he like it? You know, the yeah, yeah the that's, okay, that's the, right, the one. So what you're getting is a kind of, the word that we haven't said yet about Stein, the erotic sense of a kind of intimacy with the word patterns and rhythms and so on. So she's removing a lot of what we expect when we um, read, and she's giving you pleasure. Mm. That is, the word flow one-to-one, -one, the, the, um, the, the simple bright colors of it, saying it that way, are very pleasurable. And there's a very strong erotic charge in Stein that, um, that probably we need to talk about, although... I, let me just, I, I want to jump in there too. I was thinking about that question and I think it's a quite one answer is what she chose to read or what few things we have that she read and they tend to be the the more uh, phrase based uh, where she plays changes on the on the length of phrases if I told him if Napoleon that kind of thing which is not like tender buttons which is mm -hmm. tender buttons is harder yeah um, to to I don't think a reading of that would be as easy as the other one um, but I just wanted to add to Rachel's uh, the what you said about Stein's eroticism. Absolutely right. But it is not just an easy, pleasurable eroticism. It's a, a very intellectual eroticism of um, having a phrase of you know f four, a length of four, a length of five, or a length of three, uh, not mathematically but comparatively, and uh, playing around by not never doing exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. um, sort of keeping the erotic partner, the reader. In a, in a teasing suspense. Yeah, great. 